Hello and welcome to Leadership is a Philosophy Not a Checklist video discussion 2 on Mirren Alsop. Now Mirren Alsop is a conductor, very famous, very competent conductor. Uh, she's the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and uh, I initially had a plan to go through and sort of talk about her life and journey and all that sort of stuff uh, because I found a couple of interesting videos and then realized that uh, she actually has or is a natural leader and I'm not even sure that she realizes it. Um, she hasn't had any leadership training, she's got no management training, she's a musician and then she's been a conductor. Um, I love her story. She started out when she was nine, year, nine years old. She saw Leonard Bernstein and said, I want to be that, want to be a conductor, and then had to wrestle her whole life with a bunch of stuff. My favorite part of her life's journey is she went to um, Juilliard, got her degree from Juilliard, and then went back to Juilliard to go to conducting school, and she applied a bunch of times and never got accepted because they said she didn't have the academic qualifications to attend Juilliard, but she had been to Juilliard to get her degree. So she started her own symphony, said that, you know, up yours. And she did it right across the street or right next to Juilliard. Amazing. Um, but what happened is I was watching a couple of um, interviews with her and during her life story, she just barely touches on leadership, even though she's at leadership forums. But then afterwards, uh, during question and answer time, she suddenly has these amazing answers. So if we take what we talked about during the initial nine videos about the structure and the philosophy and what makes a natural leader and how to identify them, she has all of those. And so I'm going to analyze what she said and compare and contrast with what was done at the beginning of this series. Uh, so hopefully it's interesting. I would love to interview her because I've seen her be interviewed by quote unquote leader people and they're not talking to her about leadership. They're talking to her about her unbelievable, amazing courage and persistence and all that sort of stuff, which is great. Um, but during questions, she actually talks about leadership and but but she does it like it's instinctual. She doesn't even understand what she's talking about, I don't think. So. Hopefully, I will be able to reach out and, and be able to do an interview with her on a completely different tactic. Anyway, that's that. Next, as always, we will be doing the slideshow. So be prepared for that. Thanks. Alrighty, so welcome to the slide portion, uh, but there's also going to be some video clips in here. So what we're going to be looking at is a video that was done in 2018 at the University of Iowa talking about leadership. Now, during the main part of the video, uh, Mirren goes through and, or Mirren, uh, goes through and um, talks about her life story, which is amazing. Uh, and there's one part in the middle that's leadership related, and we'll talk about that. And then the second part of the video, uh, when she does question and, an question and answers, is when we really find out what's going on. So we will pause here and go watch the video clip. And um, then, uh, you know, it was fantastic because my friends became my teachers. And they would help me, not just about, you know, physically what worked and what didn't work, but how to communicate with them. And, you know, I started off and I would apologize. Every time the oboe played a wrong note, I'd say, I'm sorry. I don't know why, you know, it was just a, and they, they trained me out of that. They, you know, really just incredible lessons that my friends were willing to tell me and share with me. And I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to all of them. Okay. So as we can see there, uh, this is something that sort of came up before the little clip that we watched, but the entire context is that she was refused uh, to conduct or conduct her training at Juilliard where she had gone to school. So she started her own orchestra. Now, if you're going to start an orchestra and then she goes on to talk about how she learned from her players, well, what's that? Well, that's humility because she realizes that she might not have all the answers. Empathy, right? Empathy being, hey, I understand what it is you're needing or what you want, so I'm going to do everything I can to make that happen. 
Uh, and then vigilance is paying attention to herself and the environment. And then integrity. The other thing is, remember we talked about in the solution chapter, um, agreeableness and openness to experience. So she's getting feedback on what people are looking for and what they need. And all she talks about is how her team was so amazing. So what's that? Well, that's that's leadership, right? She, she, she wanted to conduct really bad and she had to do a little partnership with the orchestra, with her friends, with these people. They shared what they needed and allowed her to conduct them. You know, amazing. So um, perfect example of leadership in action. All right, so let's watch the next clip. Gross exaggeration. But I think conducting is a, um, it, it's a profession that appeals to introverts. I know this is a weird thing to say. It's kind of like acting. I think a, a lot of actors end up being, inter, you know, sort of introverts. There's something about, and for me, you know, I was never very gifted at sports or anything, but I was always the captain of the team. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was the person that, yeah, let's go, and that kind of thing. But I think it was all born out of um, an, in, an inherent introversion that I have. And there's the same thing with conducting, that, you know, it, it's a it's a way to connect on a very deep level, but not be about you. And uh, I mean, this is sort of you know true confessions. If I'm, I mean, I could just say I I want to to be in charge of the architecture, the piece, and my usual. But really, I think it's more of I, I think it's much more of a a human connection that I wanted. And I always wanted a big family. See, this is why I was <laughs> hoping no psychiatrists are here, and I'm an only child. So I think conduct. Alrighty, so uh, talks about there, conducting appeals more to introverts. Interesting, remember during the archetype, or not the archetype, but the competency, and also in the philosophy, said that most of the leaders that I know are more introverted than not. It's not the big personality and the grandiose ego all about me. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about, remember during the questionnaire when we were talking about it in the solution, where it's, you know, I ended up being in charge of things even though I didn't want to be. She talks about that. I wasn't the best, but I always ended up being the captain. Well, in my estimation, I'll bet that she never sought that out. She ended up getting selected for that because she was able to uh, attune the competencies and the environment in charge of the goals and able to help the team have a good environment and a good thing. Um, but she's never seeking power. You heard her say it right there at the end. You know, oh, I want to be the one in charge of the architecture of the music. No, she really thought it was more about the human interaction and making the music amazing. So it's not about her. You know, once again, just amazing. Um, and then notice the emphasis on I always wanted a big family. And, you know, she's got the philosophy. She's got humility. She's got empathy. She's taking care of her people. She's got integrity. And then she's paying attention to the team and the environment and what's going on. It's all there. And this was during a question and answer thing. So she doesn't even know that this is, that she's just living in the ideal leader space, in my estimation. So fascinating, fascinating to hear her say it in the way that she did, because it's exactly what we're talking about, in that she knew, or she's, she's doing it, but doesn't fully understand what she's doing, just knows that it works. And so she keeps doing it, which is fantastic, right? All right, so on to the next clip. So I, and, you know, there's, conducting also uses um, so many parts of one's brain. Um, you know, it's not just the knowledge you ha need to have about the music, but then, you know, you have to have contextual knowledge about politics, about history, about the biography of the composer, about, um, I have to know different languages, you know, I have to, so it's, uh, you never, there's never enough, um, Am, should I be done soon? I, I'm uh, sensing that. Um, there's never, there's never, um, it's a, you know, it's a bottomless pit of, of stuff to know. And that really fascinates me too. So All righty. So clip three, must have contextual knowledge of the conductor, the environment, endless requirements for knowledge. So that's fascinating. Uh, if you go and look at all of the great composers, uh, they all tear apart some of these pieces and continually re go and look at it again and try to find some new angle to make it different because it's 300 years old um, and they're trying to put their own spin on stuff. So 
going back to what we talked about with identifying somebody that has the leadership talent externally, this openness to experience and intellect. So just because the notes are written here does not mean that I can that that she can interpret them or can just get the music by playing them without any exp uh, any expression or different intonation or anything else. So you go back and you study the language, find out the environment. I mean, Beethoven's a great example. You know, all these crazy things going on in his life. And so at different times in his life, the music reflects his mood differently, or you can guess that. Um, and so it, it's fascinating. And it also takes an intellect, you know, like we talked about, it's not necessarily a high IQ, but the ability to say, oh, wow, in this environment and this and this, how would I feel? So maybe that's how they felt or they wrote down how they felt. So then how do you take a feeling and express it with a whole bunch of different instruments? It's amazing. Um, but once again, here she is talking about it and, and understanding that she's part of the part of the solution, not the only solution. It's fantastic. Uh, and then continue to question stuff. You know, is this actually the way it was supposed to be done? Uh, I was reviewing another conductor where I wasn't able to specifically find a bunch of leadership quotes from them with Michael Tilson Thomas. Uh, and he always, or he says, you know, am I, am I actually, is, is this the only way it's played? I've always heard it played this way, but why don't we try it this way and see what happens? You know, uh, so once again, a fantastic example of reflexively doing leadership stuff but not understanding that you're a leader and it fits right in with what we were talking about during the solution. <clears throat> All right, next clip. I think also, also you have to have a pretty good sense of humor um, about yourself, especially um, in order to succeed. Uh, but uh, I think leading is, a, leading is a privilege and it's a big responsibility and it requires a lot of thought. Um, and I give it a lot of thought every day and it's, quite isolating to to be a leader um, you know you I understood early that I couldn't really have friendships among the musicians you know when you're a leader you have to you have to really um, preserve that so you have to be prepared for all those things but I would say the the big thing is not to give up and and always you know always always keep your sense of humor if you can't have a good couple laughs it's really not worth it at all my dad used to say, um, you know, Marin, if you don't enjoy the rehearsals, you'll never enjoy the concert. All righty. So in that clip, leadership is lonely and you have to have a sense of humor. Well, what have we talked about during the entire prelude opening series? You're the leader. You have an important job. It's no more important than anybody else's. The impact might be worse if you mess it up, but it's a job and it takes a lot of vigilance, a lot of focus uh, to make sure that you're doing it right and to pay attention. And I just love that she says, I think about it all the time. I think about what I'm doing. Well, thinking is paying attention to something, which is the whole vigilance part. And so humility, having a sense of humor, right? Because, hey, you might make a huge mistake. Um, you might come up with this idea and go try it, and the entire orchestra is looking at you going, and you go, well, maybe that wasn't so great of an idea. We won't do it. Or maybe you try something and they don't believe you and they love it. Great. Um, and then also, once again, the integrity goes along with having, having the integrity to admit that you're wrong or admit that you've made a mistake or something like that. Um, but I just, I just love it. All right. Had a little jet airplane flyover, so had to do a little bit of an edit. So we're going to go through the conclusions again. So Marin clearly has the leadership talent. And she clearly has the leadership philosophy, right? Everything that she talks about when she's in charge of people, humility, integrity, empathy, and she pays attention, vigilance. And then she's also consistently attuning the environment and her people to achieve a goal. Um, so who helped her develop this, right? Because I don't think that she had any formal leadership training. She certainly didn't get official conductor training except for from her people. Um, and then uh, she had um, some examples. She had some mentors. She worked with Leonard Bernstein. And that leads me to another question because I want to, I'm, I'm curious, and this is something I want to try to find out. Like I said, hopefully I can interview 
uh, Marin or somebody else that has worked with Leonard Bernstein, but did did she resonate with the leadership in him? In other words, did she did she see in him leadership and all this sort of stuff, and that's what got her fired up because she ended up working with Leonard Bernstein, as did Ite, or Ite, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm sorry. And then Michael Tilson Thomas, who just stepped down as, uh, or just left as the conductor of the San Francisco Symphony. All of these conductors worked with Leonard Bernstein very closely. So is, is it that he recognized it in them or they recognized it in him? I don't know. But she clearly has the talent and she clearly developed it on her own. And so it's fantastic. Um, and then throughout her entire presentation, you notice the emphasis on family, musicians, the environment. Very literally, she talked about I and me, except when she was individually trying to do things. Um, she has a fantastic story. She refused to quit. She was talk, told a couple times no by a couple different people, and she just did her own thing. Um, one of the things that I sort of went on the clip is she said a lot of people are smart and quit when they're told no and she says I'm not that smart. Well, she had a goal and went and achieved it. So she's an amazing talent, has amazing capability, but she's also a leader if we analyze it from the outside. And I encourage you to go watch these videos to, just because she has a great story and she's a great, she's a great example. Um, and then the other thing I love is she only takes credit for the individual stuff but then she's also founded some other organizations and you can tell how proud she is of those organizations, but she doesn't talk about how amazing she is. Um, so it's just amazing. Um, and then this is the other thing that we talk about with humility, integrity, empathy, and vigilance. She has an ego, but her ego is about not quitting, right? She doesn't take credit for what the team does. She's not trying to drive the orchestra to achieve something. She has a goal and she goes after the goal. And when she talks about herself, sure. But when it talks, it comes to the, the execution of the team, you never hear her saying, well, they're amazing because I'm amazing. I'm the reason that they're so fantastic, blah, blah, blah. You never hear her say that. Super humble, lots of empathy, has integrity. Um, so then, the one thing I also wanted to do was we'll do one other clip and we can do a quick analysis of that one as well uh, in a different talk that she did um, and just listen to this and you know it'll make you it'll make you laugh uh, at how leadership oriented the solution is and it's frustrating because the person that was there never even asked a question about it I went to the musicians and this is another thing I've always tried to be transparent with them and speak to them as a group instead of through committees and all these things I mean we don't have group therapy by any means but every few months I'll take five minutes from a rehearsal and talk to them and I said to them okay you know I have an idea and you know of course they love me already and uh, I said uh, I think we should all mentor a child in the neighborhood and it's you know Baltimore's a tough place and so we'll have 90 mini me's, okay? We'll all mentor a kid, and they, you know, it was met. And I, I said, I want 100% participation, and also there'll be no compensation. So um, <laughs> that went over well, as you can imagine, and we started a huge discussion about this idea and why it wouldn't work. And, you know, I really listened to them. I listened to their issues. They were worried, where would they park in that neighborhood? I mean, you can't imagine what they were worried about. Um, but they had valid concerns also. And for the next year, I listened to what was wrong with it, how we could create it. And I brought partners in. I think as women in leadership positions, we're willing to collaborate. I think that's a key, uh, a key element in terms of creative leadership is how can you also bring more people on board um, and maximize their strengths as well. And we got, I got the police department on board. I got um, the public school system on board. Many, many after-school programs. And I went back, and the musicians were also worried that, the, um, that their salaries somehow would be diminished because we'd have to raise money from other sources for this program. So I went back to the musicians about a year later, and I said, you know, I have incredible news for you. And they looked at me with their usual excitement. And uh, uh, I said... Uh, here is your program. And, you know, it was really interesting. What can you say when someone listens to every single concern you have 
and tries to incorporate it. So I went through the whole thing. And then, of course, the hand, well, what about the fundraising? And I said, well, you know, I got all this money suddenly from MacArthur, and I'll, I'll fund it. And so that sort of ended that as well. And uh, so we started this program with 30 kids, um, after school program. Uh, and today we have 600 kids, uh, that, four years later. And um, it's called ORCIDS. And I have a short little video I thought I'd show you. All righty. So what a, great, what a great example of leadership, right? That's everything that we talked about in a nutshell. And here she tells the story. And I'm just so mad that nobody asked her about that in a question and answer in that particular video. So she had a goal. And she went and got the competent people, which was her orchestra, said, I want to, you know, here's all the things that I want. And then she listened to all of their concerns, which was all the environment. And then she attuned the competence and the environmental hierarchies in pursuit of the goal. It's exactly what she did. And, and what an amazing thing. You know, you come back and say, okay, I heard, every, I heard your concerns, but we're st here, the goal is still there. We are still going to get this done. And I've gotten it all done. And so now what? And suddenly you don't have anything else. It's one of those things, you know. Oh yeah, you know, there's no possible way we can do this. And you come back after having worked out the impossible, and then and then what? Then then sort of people don't have anywhere else to go, which is what she said. I just loved it. Uh, so anyway, hopefully this was uh, instructive and useful. So we took all of the things we talked about during the pro the prologue or the prelude, whatever you want to call it, the opening series, and then applied these to Marin Alsop's statements. And um, like I said, I believe that she has natural leadership talent. I, during this whole thing where I was looking at the other videos and these, um, I watched some stuff on a bunch of different conductors and conductors are all very competent or that, you know, I can watch and see what they're doing, but very rarely do you find the ones that are talking like this. So even though somebody's in charge doesn't mean they're a leader. Uh, and then here we have an example of somebody without a whole bunch of official leadership training that is clearly a leader. And uh, so, like I said, I really, I'm going to try an email, but she's super popular and famous, which means nobody's going to know. But I'm going to try and see if there's a way to interview her specifically on this thing. Anyway, appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, like I said, if you have any questions or anything that you'd like me to talk about, leadership is a philosophy at gmail.com. Uh, and uh, your, your questions will be rolled up into the next Q&A. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Take care.